Okay, so COVID cases and hospitalizations are on the rise in the U.S. Several new variants are spreading. Is that the case at U Chicago Medicine right now? Yeah, so I, I think um, nationally, we are definitely seeing a rise in hospitalizations of COVID itself. At the University of Chicago, it's not been something that has been Im impacted us significantly, but something that uh, we are keeping a close eye on as we see uh, maybe an uptick of cases nationwide. So do you know offhand what is the most prominent strain impacting your patients? Yeah, so we know nationally uh, there's about like 12 or 13 different um, variants uh, that are all lineages down from the Omicron variant itself. Uh, currently, the one that is composing of the largest proportion of cases is the EG5 variant itself, uh, although the other there's another variant that is becoming a, um, a bit more of a concern just given the number of mutations um, seen from the original spike mutation. That still has not uh, nationally uh, been um, shown to have as large a proportion of cases, but we're watching closely. The biggest difference, folks, to understand, I think, now should know is uh, while in past uh, waves or surges, we saw one variant that was 90 to 99 percent of all cases. We are not seeing that right now and not yet, at least um, that uh, every variant is taking one slice of the, the pie, so to speak. And currently it's this EG5 variant um, that is um, sort of on track of, of maybe having the larger slice of that pie, but still with many other variants circulating simultaneously. And would you say most of these variants, with the exception of BA286, which is, I think, the one you were talking about, um, would you say most of these variants have similar symptoms as opposed to in the past when Omicron seemed to be a little less severe than some of the others? There's nothing to suggest that any of the current circling variants are causing any more severe disease, morbidity, or death uh, compared to other variants themselves. And that includes the BA286 uh, as well. And these things we're watching very closely as we see, you know, as we progress into the winter months. Uh, but overall, the, the severity of disease um, seems to be on par with past surges or, or past variants in general. So today, Moderna said its latest booster appears to work against the BA286 strain, which again hasn't gained widespread prevalence here, but has raised alarm because, as you mentioned, of its ability to mutate. Are you concerned about the potential spread here? And do you think the current vaccines we have and that are about to be approved will work well, not only against that strain, but others? Yeah, I'm really encouraged by the report Moderna put out, as well as a few other preprints that have been out in the past week, um, testing the um, the new uh, boosters that are to be approved later this month against both uh, EG5 as well as uh, the BA286. And it looks like the neutralization cap capacity of these uh, boosters are, are effective um, uh, against these other variants, uh, which is, again, really promising and reassuring. Um, I think in general, specifically for folks who are, you know, at significant risk of severe disease, morbidity, death, older adults, um, these boosters are really critical as we enter sort of the winter months and more circulating disease when people spend more time indoors and potentially at higher risk of exposure of, of you know, this variant or variants to come. On that note, do you have any insight as to when we're going to get that new guidance on fall boosters? Yeah, I believe the ACIP will be meeting um, after FDA approval. In the middle of September is the date that's been thrown out. I haven't seen it as exact date just yet, but the timeline is middle of September uh, to expect an FDA approval through EUA. And then shortly after that, the ACIP would vote uh, either in favor or not. And then um, uh, it would be probably shipped to uh, different healthcare settings by the end of September, uh, early October to begin um, vaccination. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but just to emphasize the point, um, Moderna's news that its booster works well makes you optimistic in general about vaccines right now. And do you who do you think should be getting those boosters? Yeah, so the data from Moderna and other reports have come out showing that these newer boosters still have a capability of neutralizing um, the newer variants, uh, which is, again, very promising and, and reassuring to a lot of us. Um, you know, I think you know, the ACIP will likely make recommendations like they have for previous boosters, really prioritizing those who are at highest risk of severe disease and, and morbidity associated with COVID. So that's really going to be older adults, um, likely above age 60, if not a higher threshold of age, uh, or people with pre-existing conditions or conditions that would predispose them for more severe disease. Um, those will be the folks that will be prioritized for this new booster. Um, and so again, if you know folks listening are part of these communities or identify as part of these communities, um, to make sure that they're able to understand or know where they can get a booster and and make sure that's available to them. And what about folks who don't necessarily fall into those categories, but yeah. who are concerned about the spread of COVID? Should they be getting a booster as well? Yeah. So, I mean, I will first preface that by saying that only 20 percent of Americans are currently you know, fully vaccinated with the appropriate boosters. Um, and so there is a, still a huge swath of Americans who haven't received a single booster or maybe haven't received a vaccine in over a year, if not going on two years currently. Um, and so, uh, again, for folks that are, you know, maybe don't uh, 
uh, meet the age criteria or you know the medical condition criteria that this ACIP will uh, will put out. Um, I think it's important for them to recognize that you know these recommendations are made uh, based on who is at highest risk of of progression, and you know once that population um, has been served, um, then the ACIP can move on to the general population itself. Just like with past vaccines and boosters, really focusing on those that are impacted the most by disease and making sure that they get vaccines uh, ahead of uh, everyone else. So people should just stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, basically. and making sure that they are up to date on their vaccines and boosters in the meantime. So as cases spread, a lot of people maybe are tempted to dig into their pantries and cupboards, pull out those old COVID yeah. tests. Can you yeah. still use it if it has an expired date? Yeah, so it's important to take a look at what type of COVID test you have, and the FDA actually has a great uh, resource uh, that is looking at uh, the type of uh, test itself and the expiration dates, uh, because the FDA has increased expiration dates by about six months uh, for depending on the test for for some tests itself. So again, take a look at the expiration date, cross check it with the, F, uh, the FDA or the CDC. Um, will be important, um, uh, and then if you're low on tests, making sure you have um, some uh, in your uh, in your stockpile is 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 always a good idea idea uh, to, to, to keep on hand. Do you anticipate widespread mask use could come back? And do you think that it might be a good idea in workplaces or schools as especially hospitalizations are on the rise? Yeah, I, I think um, individualized uh, risk assessments about masking will always be, I think, the norm now, where people can think about, you know, what risk they are, who they live with, and and decide for themselves if they would like to mask in a location or not. Widespread mask mandates, I am not sure, will come back, and I, I unless or uh, unless we see this surge really explode to proportions that we saw with the original Omicron back in the winter 2021, I don't expect that to happen. Um, that being said, I think for folks who are planning on traveling who are going to be in crowded areas, um, who maybe take care of sick ones at home. Um, I think masking definitely is a good idea to protect themselves and, and then those around them. Um, and uh, based on healthcare settings and hospitals, um, you know, masking policies have shifted um, uh, and depending on what healthcare system you're at. Um, uh, but I can tell you right now, as a physician, I am masking, seeing all my patients currently. Uh, the last thing is just, is there anything we missed um, on the horizon with COVID right now or how you're feeling going into the sixth season, <laughs> if yeah. you will, and what you would yeah. tell uh, folks watching right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. We have been through this uh, time and time again. Um, I think it's important to stay vigilant uh, while not overreacting, uh, while, you know, closely watching numbers and understanding what is the potential variant and what um, what might be a cause of concern, while still recognizing that the current tools that we have, both pharmacological means, whether it be Paxlovid, whether it be uh, vaccines, new boosters, or non-pharmacological means like, you know, masking or just being sort of having a more risk calculus of how you're leading your lives all have impacts on how we can think about, you know, uh, acquiring COVID or having downstream transmission from COVID. So I think learning from what we've known for the past, you know, three, three and a half years um, is really important. And, and continuing that is sort of my only recommendation I continue to have uh, for folks.